and continual relevance of its beliefs will never succeed as long as the current fundamental beliefs of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. What he means by that is the foundations, you know, the uh, what we've been studying this week, the things on this chart. We have Daniel 2, we have uh, Daniel 8, Daniel 7, we have uh, Revelation 13, Revelation chapter 12, we have uh, Daniel 12, uh, Daniel 8, we have all the relevant uh, portions of scripture that are the foundations of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And when Dan Steed says that uh, we will never succeed as long as the current fundamental beliefs are studied in isolation from the actions of God in the 1844 Advent experience. So what we need to try to see as we study these things, not just here this week, but when we go home, when we look at these things in our home uh, time, we need to see the hand of God in the movement. Amen. Because this is the thing that will uh, uh, rivet us uh, to the foundation. Because God is in this, and uh, we have to be able to see uh, the glory. Uh, look at Second Corinthians. Chapter 4. This is the uh, introduction that Ellen White uses for the great company for the desire of ages. Verse 5 and 6. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in your hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. This is the heart of the Advent movement. And in 1798, before 1798, we had the dark time of the 1260 years. Mm -hmm. And as Jesus began to uh, open up his glory in the, the revelation of the first angel's message, uh, knowledge began to increase. And the, what the knowledge was was about uh, the Son of God himself and what he was about to do to fulfill Bible prophecy. And as he approached this time, he knew that look, one of Jesus' favorite words was, the time is fulfilled. You know, Jesus has a signature in the Bible. He says, fear not. He calls people by their name twice. And one of the other things he tells them, he says, the time is fulfilled. And here, time was fulfilled in 1798. And as we step through time then, he calls uh, someone who's going to uh, formalize the message. And that was Brother Miller. And uh, Brother Miller was a fisherman. He had a little farm in uh, <coughs> New York, and he was just a simple guy, self-educated, like many of us. <coughs> and, uh, by 1819, he figured out, uh, through the study of the Bible and the concordance, uh, the things that we're learning. And by 1831, he preached his first sermon to his neighbors. And I think that's a, a, uh, a tip. I mean, that's, uh, something that we need to take a serious look at. Your neighbor is the one that they invite you over. And that's what happened to him. You guys all know the story, right? Everyone knows the story. He was arguing with God. He, was, he didn't want to go and do the work. So he made a deal. He says, if you know, you give me a place to go, I'll go. And 30 minutes later, his nephew knocked on the door and said, hey, we ain't got a pastor. You gotta, you gotta come. And then he went out into the woods to pray. So it don't take long if you're woke. <laughs> so we have uh, then on August 11, 1840, two years prior to that, Josiah Wedge uh, predicted the fall of the Ottoman Empire by understanding uh, Revelation chapter 9. Uh, and it's uh, verse 15. Now here at this point we have the angel that comes down. The angel comes down in Revelation 10, 1. I think this is Revelation 10. Revelation 10, 1. And then uh, we also have Revelation 14, 6, and 7. All these texts in the book of Revelation are pointing to this time period. 
when uh, the first angel's message arrived in history. And then by 1841, as we uh, learned last night, this is something you can uh, write in on your uh, copies that I gave you today. Right here is where uh, the Protestant churches uh, carried the uh, doctrines of the papacy because they refused the like on the Advent message, 1841. 1842, in June, the churches, because of their decisions here, they closed the doors uh, to the Advent movement. And George Storrs, in the same year, produces uh, the understanding from his study of the Bible, the correct understanding that the dead sleep, and only Christ has immortality. And in that same year, 1842, we have, uh, in May, they meet in Boston, Joseph Bates is the head of the uh, chairman of the conference, and from Habakkuk chapter 2, uh, Charles Fitch, if I didn't mention it yesterday, that's his name, he was the one that saw that they needed to make a chart so that people could easily understand the prophecies that they were teaching. Until this time, they didn't have this. Miller had a couple of drawings, but he didn't have this. This is readily easy to see. It's very uh, visual. Because it had to be easy, and that's the text in the back. That they may run who read it. And then we had the tearing time. Now, Paul had, but before the tearing time, however, we had a falling out. Uh, progressively, as light and knowledge progresses uh, along this timeline, we have two classes of people being formed. There are those who are denying the message, closing their, when, you know, when you close the door to your heart, you also close, I mean, to your church, you close the door of your heart uh, to the truth. So that's what was taking place. But as we learned last night from uh, Jamal's talk on uh, Miller's dream, this is Miller's dream uh, in living reality. That's what this is. So if you can translate what you read in Miller's dream, uh, there's a good, if any of you have this book here, or it's, it's on the Pioneer CD ROM, but it comes from this book, and it's a uh, little study that James White did. This is called Facsimile of the Two Earliest Periodicals. And, and later on, you guys can take a look at uh, Miller's dream in there, the way they laid it out. And what James White saw in that, he saw this history. Oh, you already have one. And when he did, he knew that the people of God, at the time he did that, <coughs> Uh, they needed to have this uh, repeated today. We're going to cover today when we get down to the end of this some information about the two earliest periodicals that we've published as a people. One is the Press of Truth, and the other one's called the Advent Review. And so you, you can get a, a better understanding of these periodicals in our history. There's a couple of little nuances, and I'll share with you that will we'll help you break it. But as we go, go on, we have this uh, denial of the truth. Uh, the fall of Babylon okay, is what it is. And that comes into history in uh, 1842, the second angel's message. So we have the first angel's message, the second angel's message, and in 1844, at the disappointment, we have the entrance of the third angel's message. But prior to that, we had the midnight cry. And we learned yesterday that on August the 12th, at Exeter uh, Camp meeting in New Hampshire, uh, Elder Snow, from a study that he read in September of uh, 18, no, excuse me, May 17th of 1843, in the Signs of the Times, William Miller had produced an article on uh, the types appointed to Christ's second coming, the Passover, the, the autumn, the, the spring types appointed to <coughs> death, uh, life, and resurrection. And then Miller suggested that the autumn types in the Old Testament would point to the second advent. And so, on uh, the heels of that, we we read about uh, Foy, who had uh, also in 42, Foy had had some visions relative to the Advent movement. And I didn't mention yesterday, but he did a lot of uh, talks to a lot of different congregations on these first early visions that he had. And he, many people uh, would receive uh, salvation through uh, the work that Foy did. It's recorded in uh, this book here, but we won't go to the page. This is another set of books that you probably would like to get, especially at least the first volume. It's uh, The Early Years by Arthur White. It's 1827 to 1862. Right. It's the, the really early stuff that Mr. White was involved in. And in there, he tells you about Hazel Paul, he tells you about William Boy. And Just prior, just a few short, maybe a week, maybe 10 days before the uh, 
close of the uh, uh, expectation of Christ's second advent, the disappointment. Just shortly before it, Foy has a vision of uh, the midnight car. This is really important in Adventist history. When <clears throat> I look through the history books, and there's a lot of our historians. We have uh, F.D. Nickel, Leroy Froome, Spalding, Spicer. None of them make this connection between Foy's dream and her first, I mean, Foy's vision and her first vision. They somehow miss that connection, even though they have all the material, like uh, we, we have all the material. But the connection between, they didn't see that he was being, being shown the same uh, identical uh, proofs that the uh, chronology that they had been following in uh, Daniel 9 was rock solid. So when the Sister White has that vision, what, it, what it's telling the, the Millerites is, is that when, when we read yesterday in Word of the Little Flock that she'd given up the midnight cry, what she had given up was the correct understanding of the chronology of Daniel 9. And if you, when you step back from that chronology, that destroys everything on this chart. It wipes it all off, the, off, the, off your record. And then you're a ship without uh, a compass. And that's how they describe their early experience. Uh, with the third angel's message, you also have some duplicates on your chart. So I'm going to put some stuff up here. This is October 2nd. And you have Revelation 10 7. You have Daniel. Chapter 7, verses 9 through 10. You have Revelation 11, that is 14 through 19. When Jeff talks to you, I haven't heard the uh, stuff on the seals that he's going to be sharing with us the rest of the week. But when he does, I want you to pay a special attention to this text in regards to where this appears in history. And you'll see something that you haven't seen before. If I'm not mistaken. And uh, we also have Revelation 14, 9 to 12. These are the most relevant ones that uh, apply to the uh, third angel's message. And you need to take the, t the time and uh, to look at these in relationship to the, how this arrives in history. Because these are more than just Bible texts revealing life. They apply to the actual hindrance of this into history that cannot be uh, gainsaid. It's an actual event. It's an event, and it's more than just knowledge. It's an event. It's history. These things, this Bible text, from the one who calls himself the first and the last, the author of the beginning and the end, the one who can tell us what is about to take place. He, he tells us the end from the beginning is recorded in these texts. And he's telling us that he is the author of these events. Amen. <coughs> and then we have the visions of Sister White uh, in December of 1844. This is the first midnight cry vision. Bear with me, I need to get something for you. Oh, yes, you should. Right. And Daniel 8 14. How about Matthew 25? And Matthew 25. We'll throw that one in there. Too. See, we have Bible students here. Very good. How about Malachi 3? Malachi 3. Okay. All right. And, all right. We got Mal Malachi 3. And, then, and if you, uh, the big 26. Oh, that's right. We we'll, we'll, put it up, we'll put it up here the way Miller did, right? Yeah. Now, Leviticus, Leviticus 26 is uh, at the top of the chart. We have uh, right up here, uh, it says, it's the very one at the top corner. It says Leviticus chapter 26, verses 28 to 34. So we'll put 28 to 34 over here. All right, and 
What I wanted to share with you this morning is uh, two. back at two, right over here. Back at uh, chapter two, two and three. Two and three. Right here. Well, back at two, two and three. Under the chart. That's why I'm under the chart. That's why I'm under the chart. Right. That's exactly right. You said in 1841 there was a messenger rejected that went. Yes, what, what they did was, in 1840, when uh, the first thing the message comes into uh, uh, history, one of the things that took place in 1840, when the fall of the Ottoman Empire occurred on August 11, 1840, it proved the year-day principle. Amen. That principle was set in stone. Before the actual uh, fulfillment of a prophecy based on a time prophecy using that formula, um, a year for a day, uh, there was questions to whether or not Miller was off of his rocket. Many people assumed that none of this was going to happen. But when it took place just as predicted, and it was done two years ahead in advance, to the very day. Now, I mean, and, and you know, you start back in history at 1449, <coughs> and you figure out in 1838 the fall of, this was not, most, this was not a small empire. Jeff hasn't shared this week, but there's a, uh, Things you can learn about the fall of an empire in here. We don't get to that, but we, we won't go there right now. But so, uh, and what they did was the light of the first angel when it comes. The leading ministers of the Protestant denominations did not accept this message. The people that were farmers, the people that were poor in spirit, the meek shall inherit the earth. Amen. They accepted the message. But the leadership in the Methodist denomination, the Lutheran denomination, the Episcopalian denomination, <coughs> you name them down the list. Miller said there were 666 sects of different denominations that were Protestant at the time. That, that might add some interesting fuel to the information. <laughs> wow. But they, they would reject this message from the leadership. And then they would try to uh, enforce it in, in the uh, lady. And that's why they closed their doors in 1842. And that's why Sister White gives that uh, history mark uh, in First Thessalonians, page 21. What I've learned about Sister White is a very phenomenal, it's a wonderful thing. Just as the other prophets sometimes didn't realize the information they were given, was to uh, allow them to see <coughs> certain things. Sister White may not have realized when she wrote that in first wife of the testimony that it would be relevant uh, in our time and we would see this. She may not have recognized it, but through the inspiration of the Spirit, like other uh, like texts in the Bible, today we see things because of, of the relevance. So, uh, the prophets, even though they wrote, they would desire to look into these things. We find this article by Sister White, which is very important. <laughs> these two articles right here are on the Pioneer CD line. This is the one. <laughs> Concerning these two articles about her visions, this is the first vision in December of 44, and this is the second vision. We know the date of this one because she says February 1845, and, and Arthur White gives us the date. I believe they said the 14th of February, if I'm not mistaken, some, right in that next word. And uh, 15th, the 15th, February the 15th. Oh, sorry. That's the date of the publication that she wrote. Uh, for, for, let's just say February 45, that's close enough. But, uh, <coughs> this article tells you something about the first article that you don't know until you read the second one. And what she says is this to uh, Brother Jerry. My vision, which you published in the Day Star, was written under a deep sense of duty to you, not expecting you, would pub not accept expecting you to publish it. Had I for once thought it was to be spread before the many readers of your paper, I should have been more particular and stated some things which I left out. 
As the readers of the day start seeing a part of what God has revealed to me, and as the part which I have not written is of vast importance to the saints, I humbly request you to publish this also in your paper. God showed me the following one year ago this month. And then she goes and she says, I saw a throne, and on it sat the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. So you need to read both these in the context of what she's telling Brother Jacobs. They're part and parcel of the same uh, life. They go together. Just like uh, Daniel 7 goes with Daniel 8. That's how it's laid out. So I think that's important uh, to understand how the, we begin to understand the importance of the midnight cry in Adventist history. God laid out succinctly for us from the very beginning when Foy would not, uh, Foy refused to present his vision on the midnight cry. He would not present it because he didn't understand it. So they got, uh, chose Ellen White and gave her the prophetic gift. What date was that? Did he have that? We don't know the exact date. We just know it was a few weeks before the disappointment. Okay. Less than two. And now, uh, as we go uh, forward here, uh, as we come to a very important event. This event in Adventist history is the catalyst for many things that precede this event. And this is 1845, April the 29th, we had the Albany Conference of the Millerite in New York City. <coughs> Albany is the home of uh, Joseph Marsh, and I believe George Storrs. Don't, don't quote me on the last guy, but I know Joseph Marsh. Some of the people would not attend. We won't go in today. You can look it up in the history books, but there was a whole list of members of, that met at this conference. But Snow would not be there, James White would not be there, Joseph Bates would not be there, and the uh, uh, but the ones that were there was Josiah Litch, the big names, Litch, Hines, Miller, uh, Elon, Galushua. These were big names in Millerite history. They were in their states that they were, these were people from different states that were coming together in a conference. The reason they came is to try to settle all the winds of doctrine that had come in and all the fanaticism that came in after the disappointment of October 22nd, 1844. And, to a man, and they signed on to it as a group, they would deny the very chronology that led them to the Advent truth. They would deny the chronology of Daniel 9. Now, Joseph Bates would later write that this would, uh, he called this denial of the truth uh, the Church of Laodicea. So in our Adventist doctrine, uh, our history, Later to see it begins to be understood here. The Church of Philadelphia, by the way, we need to write back here that this is the Church of Philadelphia. Philadelphia is back in this timeline leading up uh, to, uh, especially during the Midnight Cry uh, feast, but in here. And uh, there's a change also from, from Sardis to Philadelphia in this timeline that you need to see. We're going to show that in another chart uh, tomorrow. But Philadelphia and Laodicea. And I'm going to go, go a little ahead of myself here, but <coughs> back down, in the, down here in uh, 56, I won't write it in yet until I get down here, but down in 1856, James White will write in a, in a series of sermons on the seven churches of Revelation. When he gets to the Laodicean church, he will declare that the Sabbatarian Advent church is Laodicea. We're here, Joseph Bates and many others will uh, call those who met at Albany Laodicea. You need to understand, it's a little bit of a, uh, you need to look at this for yourself. And when you do, you'll see that there is some uh, changes being made in the faith of God's people in such a way that they're beginning to see things that they hadn't seen yet before in the story of the seven churches. 
things are starting to come to life. Light is progressing. And later in 1863, when you read the testimonies, Ellen White will agree with her husband, and you'll find it in, uh, I, didn't get the, I didn't bring the reference, but if you just type in later and see it in uh, 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 Ellen White CD-ROM, it'll come up on the first hit, because that's her first mention of it. Okay. <laughs> Testimony volume one. Testimony one, but it's 1863, I don't know the page number. But you'll find that she's in agreement with her husband, and he wrote it uh, <coughs> seven years ahead of the testimony that was given. And one of the things you guys need to know about the uh, early periodical work was that James and Ellen White would proofread it until the, the sun, until all night long until sun up. Sister White complained later she carried a kink in her neck for many years from the uh, toil and labor of proofreading the present truth in the Advent Review. So when people stop and think of it and they try to tell you that we've changed things, early on Ellen White uh, saw to it herself that the things that came off the press were uh, rock solid. Amen. Rock Amen. solid. And it was done through uh, hard labor late into the night. We don't have that dedication today in the church. No, we do not. We want it easy, but it's not going to be easy from here on out. Uh, and then maybe when you since you hear this, now when you read in her read Spiritual Gifts Volume One about the history of this event, read Volume One of the testimonies, and you'll have some understanding that these people are telling you, you, you know, they didn't have a penny to their name. They were they didn't have anything, and uh, they put everything into the cause. Amen. It would kill James White early. He didn't live a long life. He went to the grave in 1881. He was born the same year. My dad was born in the 20th century. Different century. But James White was born in 21, the uh, century before. My mother was born in 27, a century later. And Ellen White was born in 27, a century later. I thought that was kind of interesting. <laughs> so, from 21 to 81, you can count it up. He was a young man. Went to, went to his grave, an early grave. Uh, so here they would deny <coughs> the chronology of the 2300 days. And they would say that it was yet in the future. Now, I don't know how you can deny it and then say it was in the future. And that's where we get the information in early writings, page 74, on time. That's, that's what she's referring to. So when you try to take the information, that's the best word, way to put it, the false information, I mean, that's a fair way to put it, that uh, we have been passed down to us from Willie White, from Arthur White, on her comment of the, of the daily in early writings, when you accurately understand the history, she's just not saying that about time. Because what they started to do was readjust the chronology of Daniel 9. In denying the original chronology, James White called it the original faith. I'll show you that here today. Uh, they began to adjust the time. The first new time setting would be out in the autumn of 45. And when you do that, you deny this chart, mm -hmm. everything on it. And it's similar to what we did when we denied the 508. Mm -hmm. It's identical. Because you pull everything out from underneath the chronology. When you, when you attack, any, any, all these are based on the year-day principle. And they're all based on the chronology of Daniel 9, from the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem. And the timeline lines out, and you notice that Miller, right here, 508 and 1335 come to 1843. In Froome's book, Elder Froome, you know, uh, writes a, a thing in his book about a letter that Charles Fitch wrote about this chart <coughs> to William Miller. No, it was, it was about the 508 to William Miller. And Fitch, right away, as, he, as, as you should, you should be a good Dorian, he wanted to know where Miller got his sources for his understanding of the 508 in history. Well, 
We have the letter from Fitch to Miller, but we never found, or the letter from Miller back to Fitch is non-existent. So, but, but because Leroy Froome sees this chart as if they denied the data, that's what he writes. That when Fitch would make the chart, he says of the chart that Fitch doesn't make any mention of the data. That's how he sees it. And then he would uh, later write that William Miller had, just before he would go out in 1831 to preach his first sermon, he still wanted to check all his references. Miller was quite a guy. So he sits down, and there were some other people in his day, after he had come to his own conclusions from Bible study by 1819, he would then begin to be familiar with some of the other Protestant writers of, of uh, uh, earlier than him, Sir Isaac Newton, others, and there was one particular gentleman, I don't remember his name, but Froom names him, that Miller, he predicted that the advent would be in 1847. So Miller matched wits with this guy, and he came away from matching wits with this guy and said, no, 47 isn't the date. And the reason he would hold on to his understanding is because of two time prophecies. And those two time prophecies are 457 BC leading down to 1843, and the other one was 508 in 1335 leading to 1843. So, Froome <coughs> proves himself to be an error in his own book. <coughs> he, he didn't catch, he, he needed to match one wit and the other wit when he wrote his uh, book, uh, Questions on Doctrine. Because if, if this if this time was so important to Miller that he would never step down from it, never backed away from it for 23 years, is the words of Froome. It's all about the data. It's about the data. And this is not a denial of the data, but it is a, it's screaming at you that the data is about it. And so Froome missed that, but if you read this book carefully, you'll see that that's what he's done. But, but it's not in questions on doctrines, it's on, it's historical. It's, uh, Prophetic Faith of Our Fathers, Volume 4. Did I say questions on doctrine? Oh. Prophetic Faith of Our Fathers, Volume 4. Now, so we, we get here to the, to the latency and condition is reached. And it's in prison, the present truth articles by Joseph Bates are rich in his understanding of, uh, the latency and condition of the, after the Albany Conference. Uh, now we come to some uh, very important truths. Joseph Bates is a giant in our history. And here, right here, this very important truth comes to light. We all know the story of Rachel Oaks. We all know the story of Wheeler. And that's where uh, uh, Wheeler gets converted to the Sabbath by Rachel Oaks. He attends a, a, a prayer meeting on a, a, on a Sabbath at, at the, the uh, Oaks, uh, <coughs> what do they call it, uh, family church. They had a church on Sunday in the family home. And uh, he gave a sermon, and uh, the sermon uh, was obviously to her. This man was uh, all, all sound because he was keeping Sunday. And Rachel Oates later said to him, you need to keep all the commandments of God, and she gave him a Bible study on the Sabbath. And Wheeler then accepted the Sabbath truth. Mm. And uh, she was not a Millerite, and uh, neither was he, by the way. But uh, in, in providentially, Joseph Bates gets hooked up with Wheeler. And it was during the time of the Albany Conference. That's where Joseph Bates was at, instead of being at Albany. Joseph Bates was up having a Bible study with Brother Wheeler instead of, uh, instead of being at Albany. Now this is, uh, this advances present truth in such a way that this is where Christ was leading us to. Because you remember yesterday I said in Leviticus, Sabbath reform was the issue. And at the end of the disappointment, Sabbath reform is the same issue. It's always been Sabbath reform. The reason that Jews went into captivity was because of Sabbath reform. This is the light that brings us to the investigative judgment. The investigative judgment on October 22, 1844, 
brings this truth when God is about to denominate a people. Every time God denominates the people, every time revival and reformation come to the church, it's on Sabbath reform. And so Bates is up with Wheeler, and uh, by 1846, he publishes his first pamphlet on the Sabbath tree. First pamphlet on the Sabbath tree. Now, there's the weakness of humanity is in this story. Remember, he chose on white the weakest of the weak. She had not yet embraced the Sabbath truth, and neither had her husband. And in this same year, Joseph Bates will introduce to her the Sabbath truth through his pamphlet. When you read Arthur White's writings and you read Ellen White's writings herself, she would deny the Sabbath truth. She would deny it. She thought that Bates was wrong. But Ellen White has her first vision a year later. In 1847, where the Sabbath truth is verified uh, through inspiration. And then, in the same year, 1847, Bates will publish his second Waymarks and High Heat. It, was, it came out in the Treasure Truth articles. And I believe he also printed it in pamphlet form. Now we come to uh, Miller has his dream. We had the dream study last night. Miller has his dream the same year. So we have uh, 1847, uh, the Sabbath vision. We have 1847, Bates publishes uh, second. Advent Waymarks and High Heat. Waymarks and High Heat. And we have uh, Miller's Dream. It's recorded in uh, The Present Truth, page 75. Let me just get that for you so you can see the relevancy of this. Page 75. This is the study that James White does on uh, Miller's Dream. Page 75, Present Truth, page 75. Uh, the date of the publication is uh, April of 1850. It's volume 1, number 9, April 1850. And it's here. Oh, Miller dates the uh, letter the 7th and 3rd, 1847. So Miller died in 49. So Miller is still uh, communicating to the brethren. And he communicates this dream uh, the 7th and 3rd, 1847. And James White gets this from a periodical that one thing you need to understand, these are these early pioneers, they would write back and forth and they would use the periodicals as their uh, uh, currency, so to speak, the avenue by which they could discuss this with one another. So James White would write to these an article, it would go to uh, the Voice of Truth, it would go to the Jubilee Standard. Joseph Bates would write the same way, and so Miller's getting these at his home. All Miller, I mean not Miller, James White would be getting all these different periodicals to his home, and he would extract from them the things he needed, and that's how we get this truth. So whoever. Wherever this was first published, I don't know where it was first published, but uh, James White extracted it from some periodical that landed on his doorstep, and then he reproduced it in the present truth. Uh, and now we have 1848. Does anybody know what happens in 1848? Very good. Who said that? I did. Oh. <laughs> so we have the Sabbath conference. Now, do we know the history of the Sabbath conference? Any other? What happened was they met in several 
from 48 to 49, they met at about three or four Sabbath conferences, and they would meet. Now, if we're talking about a group like we have here, size of, they, that's all the believers they have, at the most, about maybe a little less than that on some occasions. And they would hammer out the truth that we now stand on, a foundation of the rock solid. And they would risk life and limb to get to these conferences. What drove them to these conferences was because now they had the light on present truth. <coughs> present truth is the third angel's message. Once that message landed in the experience of the Millerites who by faith followed Jesus into the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary, let's look at Revelation chapter 3 now. Revelation chapter 3. This is, this is critically important to understand in your own experience. Not theirs, but you can learn from theirs about your own. This is what God wants us to see. When we can't stress enough, myself, Jeff, and Jamal, <coughs> you can't take our words for these things. You must study this for yourself to see if what we're telling you is right. And if you do, I believe you will find that God's Holy Spirit will tell you that these things are true. Because that's what I believe, because I study it for myself, and I believe it's true. And the angel of the church of Philadelphia write these things, say that he that is holy. Now this will tell you something if you're if you're got your thinking cap on this morning. When I show it to you, you'll see something on this history. And if you didn't know the history, you, you would miss this. But it's here on the board, and the Bible is going to reveal something this morning that you can see. And you're going to love this. Watch this. <laughs> Chapter 3, verse 7 of the book of Revelation. Chapter 3 of Revelation, verses 7 and 8. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write these things, saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. It's here that the door is open in Philadelphia. And that open door allows them to see this light on the Sabbath truth. Do you remember? <coughs> This, this is what it's going to help you to see. Remember how Bates declared these people to be there to see them? Well, the Sabbath truth is still Philadelphia. So, Bates never after this time wrote that this was later to see them. Never again did he make that mistake. Because the Delbany Conference later to see had to enter into the community. That's not a reality. What is the reality is 1856 when James White was right that the Sabbatarian Adventist believers had become later to see it. They had, be, they had become to deny present truth by their love of the world. Not Sabbatarian Seventh day Adventists. That's what they call themselves. Now, so. This, this information here in Philadelphia is telling you that this open door is connected with this truth on the third angel's message. That's what's bringing into history. When the door was opened and Jesus stepped through it on October 27, 1844, when that Sabbath truth landed in history, Philadelphia then had that light and she needed to carry that light and not become Laodicea. <coughs> But when she would not carry that light and she had one foot in the world and one foot in the church, okay. that's the way we are today. And that's the problem. We have not carried the third angel's message as we should to the world. And that's why the subject of Christ our righteousness would come in 1888. One of the big things that the church has missed is that when Ellen White writes these words, that Christ our righteousness is the third angel's message in verity, that means in truth, that because that's because Christ our righteousness is recorded in this history. And it's the righteousness of Christ in the believer that carries the Sabbath truth in the third angel's message. The third angel's message doesn't stand alone for the righteousness of Christ. And in, in our 
seminaries and in our thinking, we've separated the two subjects and made them two subjects when actually they are one. In her comments to what Joseph Wagner had written on righteousness or spoken on righteousness by faith, she says, yes, I've been preaching that or and writing about that for 40 years. That's a good point. She said, only between my husband and I have I heard such language as what Wagner presented at the Minneapolis conference. So this was not new to Sister White, but this was new life <coughs> in direct confirmation of the old. Brother Dwayne, doesn't a lot of confusion come when we say the Laodicean is the last and final church? Philadelphia goes all the way through. No, the Laodicean church, Sister White writes to them and she says, the blessing in, in the true testimony of the true witness is that Laodicea is our overcomers. And then they had the Philadelphian experience. Right. So you need to understand so the Philadelphian it. church is our is our example. Our example is the book. Coming. Our example is the book of Revelation. The seven churches after the, after Laodicea, there is no other church. There are seven churches, not eight. But the Laodiceans in their overcoming experience had the experience. Oh, they had the experience of Philadelphia. Okay. So we, uh, right. as we come forward uh, on our chart, we want to see that now, what are they going to do with all this? How are they going to get this to the world? They have the Sabbath truth. They know that the chronology of Daniel 9 is rock solid. They know the brethren at Albany have denied the truth. They know the brethren at Albany have stepped back. Ellen White's uh, Vision of the midnight cry has shown that they have fallen off into darkness. Now, we won't go into this here because it's a very, very hard subject to understand and recover, but there's also the subject of the shut door. I don't have the time to get in that, into that this morning, but it's, it, it's very easily understood if you understand it in the light of the, the stepping through of this history. But there's a shut door controversy too. And to get this unraveled, James White would write in uh, the book, uh, so the little flock, I can't think of the first part, the word of the little flock, that the sheep have been scattered. That's what he would write. And the scattering was done by all the different fanaticisms that came in after the uh, disappointment. So how is God going to gather the, his jewels, is what the point is. How, how are they going to begin to be gathered? How are we going to retrieve some of those who step back <coughs> off and return the truth? <coughs> That's when they produce the first periodical in our denomination called the Present Truth. <coughs> and it would be done in 1849. Now we're coming up into the time when we need to put in the other chart. I'm going to put it right here. Here's the 1850 chart. The relevancy of this uh, statement that Jeff has in our notes, Jamal and Jeff, I think Jamal did this study for us. Uh, page 63. Where's the one uh, that has the comment on the two charts? Let's see. 59. 59. Well, the 1843 chart, she says, I have seen that the 1843 chart was directed by the hand of the Lord and that it should not be altered, that the figures were as in one of them, that his hand was over and hit a mistake in some of the figures so that none could see it until his hand was removed. Early writing, page 74. Now, the Otis Nichols 1850 chart, you know, uh, there's a picture of Otis Nichols in one of these books, and Otis was quite a character, but Brother Nichols uh, produced this chart for the brethren. Um, his name appears right here, uh, published by O. Nichols. Uh, 
Dorchester, Massachusetts. Now, he was a Millerite that came over and became a faithful Sabbatarian Adventist believer. Amen. And he was a real uh, boon uh, to the early work. Some of his articles appear in the present truth. They're worth their weight in gold for the information that you can glean from his understanding of what the, the experience that they went through. Uh, this is what it says. I saw that God was in the publishment of the chart by Brother Nichols. I saw that there was a prophecy of this chart in the Bible, and we know that's the back. That prophecy is the whole chart. And if this chart is designed for, and that this chart is designed for God's people, if it is sufficient for one, it is for another. If one needed a new chart painted on a larger scale, all needed just as much. So Ellen White is telling you that the light on this chart is being carried over onto this chart. That's what she's telling you. I need to uh, take this down. No, I need the chart. See the difference in the two. <coughs> Fundamentally, on the chart, what you see is pretty much the same. They didn't change the design too much. The main information on the time boxes is down the center of the chart. Over here, we have the first, second, and third angels message. This is a little new. Over here, we have the Ottoman Empire, we have the Mohammedan Empire. We have the first bold trumpet, the second bold trumpet, and here we have the third bold trumpet. <clears throat> That's new. This is a new piece on the chart. This is also the seventh seal. Jeff, cover that. Here we have the image of the papacy. One of the leading doctrines that came out of the Sabbath conferences was an understanding of the image of the, the image of the papacy. What led them to this understanding <coughs> was the Sabbath truth, because it was not. Remember how we said here yesterday that the Protestant churches would begin to retain and carry the beast by, re by retaining their doctrines? Mm -hmm. Two of the doctrines, the immortality of the soul and Sunday sacredness. That's, what, that's how the papacy enters into the United States under advancing light. Mm -hmm. As this light's rejected and they reject it, the papacy has this opportunity. And we know that we read, heard yesterday from Jamal that this is, the papacy is Satan's master plan. So Satan is thrilled when, this, when the Protestant churches deny this Advent truth. He knows they will deny the Sabbath truth. He knows they will retain the immortality of the soul. But here, on, in advancing light, the immortality of the soul and the false prophet, because of the understanding of those two doctrines, they began to understand Revelation chapter 13 in all its clarity. So when you hold on to those doctrines, Sunday sacredness, and the immortality of the soul, you're robbed of advancing life. Now Sister White makes something very important to be understood in the great controversy. One of the two things that are going to be joined together to deceive the whole world at the Sunday law. One of the two things. The immortality of the soul and the Sunday sacredness. It will do the same work as it did here. It will do the identical work. And they will deny present truth. Present truth is leading to the Sabbath truth. It always points to Sabbath reform. In every one of those reform movements that we had up on the board this week, that Jamal and Jeff have been showing us, present truth leads to keeping all the commandments of God. Amen. That's what it leads. And if we understand what we're learning here this morning, it's through the righteousness of Christ. Yes. The commandment keeping is possible. Amen. On our own, we're powerless. Amen. We're the weakest of the weak, somebody just prayed yesterday. And the weakest of the weak need one who's mighty to save. 
In the Old Testament, he was called the Tower of Jacob. Yes. That's what he's called. The other difference is we have the most holy place. Uh, they had that understanding on here. And other than that, this is, this is different too. Uh, let me look over here before I close my big mouth. Uh, they had the third book coming here. At the bottom of this one, so they're, they're both there. And, and here, they have it designed so that you can really, they notice what they've done here? They put a large emphasis on these blow trumpets on this chart. They place this where you can not miss it. And they're aligning it with these truths on time problems. So let's read now the statement again that, that Sister White makes on, uh, <clears throat> 39. Let's read it again. I saw that God was in the punishment of the chart by Brother Nichols. I saw that there was a prophecy of this chart in the Bible. And if this chart is designed for God's people, if it is sufficient for one, it is for another. And if one needed a new chart painted on a larger scale, all needed just much. So now. Let's look at a statement from Present Truth, or the, the periodic, the very first one they printed. This is what James White says. As they begin to advance this truth through the printed page, we know the story of how this was done. James White would cut wheat for, these, for the payment of these first articles to get this stuff out to the world. They uh, <laughs> saw that they needed to have an organ to present this uh, to, and who they were trying to really reach in the very beginning of this were those Millerites that had had this advancing life in their background. They really weren't much interested yet in a missionary effort out to the rest of the world at this time, but they were really wanting to reach those that had had this in their uh, background. Okay, they were trying to reach those who had been impacted by the Millerite movement. So he says, "Wherefore I will," he says, "Wherefore I will not be negligent." Put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them, and be established in the present truth. Second Peter one twelve. So this text is big in that history because this begins the publishing work that Ellen White saw would go like leaves of autumn all the way around the world. You need to connect this with our history. So this is what meant that statement. She was making it in the context of the experience of the Advent movement moved by the hand of God in eighteen forty four. That wasn't a uh, statement pulled out of the clear blue sky by some type of magic inspiration. That inspiration was connected to the history of the Advent League. It is through the truth that souls are sanctified and made ready to enter the everlasting kingdom. Obedience to the truth will kill us to this world that we may be made alive by faith in Jesus. Notice what they see here in the advancing present truth. Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. John chapter uh, 17, verse 17. 17, 17. This was the prayer of Jesus. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Uh, 3 John, verse 4. Error darkens and fetters the mind, but truth brings with it freedom and gives light and life. And true charity or love rejoices in the truth. Thy law is truth. What does that mean? Uh, the text for that is uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 6. I'm sorry, Corinthians chapter 13, verse 6. Mm -hmm. And the other one is Psalms 119, verse 142. Mm -hmm. David describing the day of slaughter when the pestilence shall walk in darkness and destruction waste at noonday, at noonday, so that a thousand shall fall at thy side and ten thousand at thy right side, says, He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shall thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and thy buckler. Psalms, well, this is a Roman numeral I can't read. 41, that's right, it's 41 verse 4. We'll, we'll, so this is this is what the idea they had in presenting this to the, to the believers. Now, present truth would be published 
up through <coughs> November of 1850. But in August of that year, they were at up touring the uh, brethren, strengthening the brethren throughout various places. And uh, they're showing that they need to do something else with advancing present truth in the publishing work. Present truth, this is Arthur White, page 179, volume 1 of the early, the, the early years. Present truth, and then 10 issues published over a period of 11 months. So in 11 months, they would publish the, the, the issues, of, 11 issues, of, uh, 10 issues of present truth. Heralded the third angel's message with the Sabbath truth as the focal point. But the eye of the Lord saw a need extending beyond this. Something that would bring men and women who had been in the great advent awakening to see the experience in its true light as the work of God. Now, interestingly enough, Dan Steed's insights to understand the hand of God in the advent movement based on the testimony of the spirit of prophecy is the very reason that the publishing work takes a change. It takes a shift. Because they needed it just as much as we need. So, something that would bring men and women who had been in the Great Advent Awakening to see the experience in its true light as the work of God. Ellen White would write, wrote on this in August the 4th of 1850. So they printed these present truths from 49, in 11 months, from 49 uh, through November of 1850. But in August of 1850, still it, with a couple more uh, issues of the present truth to, to print from August to November, they get this new light. The Lord showed me that he, James, must take the testimonies that the leading Adventists, that would be Josiah Lidge, Joseph Marsh, uh, Hiram Benson, not Hiram Benson, uh, Joshua B. Hine, and others, published in 1844 and republished them and make them ashamed. Now this is not, um, that word, when I first read this, I thought about it, but what she's actually saying there is, she wants them to bring back their sense of reality. She wants them to see what they have done in the life of advancing the present truth. This is what God wants them to see. This is why it's the messenger. But it's too, that's what, what, what they want to take place. So now there's uh, some very important, interesting information. One little nuance that you might appreciate. Today we have the Review and Herald, right? Well, the Review and Herald was really called the Advent Review and Sabbath Herald. That's what it was originally called. But before we had the Advent Review and Sabbath Herald, we had Advent Review. So we had Present Truth, Advent Review, Advent Review and Sabbath Herald, and today we have the Review and Herald. <laughs> so the periodical has changed four times in our history. Well, I was going to get to that. Um, this is the early stuff. Now, we, now, you can still get Advent Review, by the way, or Review and Herald, but the one that they're mailing out to all the church members is now called Advent World or something like that. But if you subscribe to Ad Review and Herald, you can still get it. So we have Present Truth, Advent Review, Advent Review and Sabbath Herald, and we have the Review and Herald, and now this new one that is... <laughs> we'll, we'll leave it that. Um, the four or present truth, Advent Review, Advent Review and Sabbath Herald, and Review and Herald. Yeah? I got Review and Herald, Advent World, Let's start over. Let's, let's listen from there. Let me put them on the word for you. I know, we're running out of time. We got present truth. Advent Review, Advent Review, and Sabbath Herald. And we have Review and Herald. Okay. 
I wanted to get to at least this part today to let you see the relevancy of these two charts in Advent history so you can understand the light we're being told this week based on the foundational truth of Seventh-day Adventism. These two charts, I won't prove this today to you, but I can. These two charts, I'll go ahead and say this. These two charts are, uh, Two candlesticks. The two candlesticks that stand before the God of the Holy. Amen. That's what these two charts are. Now, to show this, I want to show you what James White does. Oh. They begin to print the Advent Review in uh, August of 1850. He goes home immediately and puts the first issue out. And they have not yet completed all the issues of the present truth. That's a little nuance you need to grab. Because this was petty work, hard work, fruit reading late into the night. They had they sacrificed their health to get this done. No one yeah. writes about it. They almost killed both of them. But they went ahead with it. So uh, here in eighteen fifty in August. It would produce the first issue of uh, Advent Review, and then the last issue of Present Truth would be in November of that same year. Okay? But what you want to see is in the first issue of Advent Review, this is very important to understand. When I first began to understand this, it was very confusing. I mean, it was very confusing to try to get between my ears the difference between these periodicals and how they were laid out. But once I got it, it, it helped me to see things that I had never seen before. This is what it says. He's going to tell you why he's writing this now. Remember Sister White says that I was shown that they wanted to shame those who had left the truth? Our design in this review is to cheer and refresh the true believer by showing the fulfillment of prophecy in the past past, wonderful work of God in calling out and separating from the world and nominal church a people who are looking for the second advent of their new state. Those who claim to be Adventists should be consistent, acknowledge the mean, acknowledge the mean, that he wants us to acknowledge the mean, this light right here, that God in mercy has employed to bring them to the light of the advent truth and which has made them what they are. No one will deny the fact that it was the proclamation of the time, 1843, as it, was, as it was written on the chart. Where does he take them? Chart. <clears throat> so, when we go home and we want to present this <coughs> to our Sabbath schools, and we want to have people maybe get on board here, we can take them to this statement right here and show them that in the history of the Advent movement, when they stepped off the platform, when they didn't understand the present truth, and it was sealed up, they had to be taken back to the foundation. And it is in the chart where they find that fancy present truth. Jeff and Kathy have those in their ministry. Just talk to Kathy or Jeff afterwards. Kathy probably knows all the Christ. Uh, <clears throat> they were taken to the chart. <clears throat> Brother Duane, what you're saying is so important. I hope the DVD doesn't run out. Uh, well, I, I, I got one more and we'll quit. Now, to, to prove this, again, now this... When I found these two corroborating evidences about the chart, this is the testimony of two established the truth. Okay? I have, a, I, have a, I have a second testimony about the chart. Uh, this was April of 1850. This is advancing light on the 38th of the message. This is advancing light on the 38th of the message. When they wrote the present truth, they were writing it to the little flock scattered abroad. They weren't, they weren't writing it to bring back those, to shame those that had stepped off the platform. But even to the little flock, to encourage them, they too are taken back to the foundation, and they're standing on a foundation, and this is 
bona fide evidence that the vision of Ellen White, the Midnight Cry vision, stands on record as pointing to the 1843 chart. Leading in it is in, in, in this in this chart is contained the history of the Midnight Cry. <laughs> so she was shown that the Midnight Cry was a light set up behind the people of God to be a light on their pathway, all the, leading them all the way to the city of God. And the light in the Midnight Cry is contained on the 1843 chart. And show us how to read it, please. We will. Okay. <laughs> how we're going to do that, brother, is the way I have learned. You need to buy a chart. Then you need to study everything on it until you understand it. I can't show you. I was challenged by Future for America nine years ago, and I found that I wasn't the Adventist I thought I was. And I can't stand before you today and do tell you these things, except I can tell you I studied the chart myself. No one can study it for you. You have to study it yourself. Let me, let me, let me, let me get by that. Let me get here. The 13th chapter of Revelation and the first five verses of the 14th chapter presents a connected chain. Catch this. Past, present, and future. This is advancing present truth. A connecting chain. Events down to the complete, complete redemption of the 144,000. Now, if you heard this, what they've been hearing this week, we've been talking about the repetition of this truth at the end of the world, and it's the 144,000. The testimony that we're reading here is advancing truth then, and it's advancing truth now, telling the same identical story. Let's read it again. The 13th chapter of Revelation, and the first five verses of the 14th chapter, presents a connected chain of past, present, and future events, down to complete redemption of the 144,000. When they will stand on Mount Zion with the Lamb, someone should say, Amen. 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 Then he says, the whole Advent host once believed that publishing the visions of Daniel and John on the chart from which the swift messengers lectured in 42, that's when Babylon fell. God doesn't leave those who are about to step off the platform without a witness and a testimony. And the messengers would be, those messengers are the first and second angel's messengers. And if you understand Ellen White's writings, that those messengers are not just messengers from the Bible, but they are living messengers. They are Seventh-day Adventists who give a living testimony to the truth. It took flesh and blood to believe these things on this, on this chart. So the flying messengers were William Miller, Joshua B. Hines, and the rest who gave these advancing truths to the world. The whole Advent host once believed that publishing the visions of Daniel and John on the chart from which the swift messengers lectured in 42 and 43 was a fulfillment of this prophecy, and the unbelief of those who doubt now does not prove that we are all mistaken then. The passing of the time and the perpetual backsliding and unbelief of Adventists has not changed this truth of God into a lie, but it remains true. And it's based on the 18th century. This is the present truth. Oswego, New York, April 1850, Volume 1, Number 9. The title of it is The Third Angel's Message. This is the most important document ever produced by early Sabbatarian Seventh-day Adventists, in my humble opinion. It's advancing truth on the Third Angel's Message. And it points you to the foundation of the 1843 Millerite chart to understand this advancing truth. We cannot deny this as a people. It's in black and white. And if you don't think what we've been hearing, that these things are being unsealed to us as God's people at the end of the world, they have not understand what I've told you until you've heard here today. Jeff doesn't understand it. He's been telling you this. But what we heard here this morning is that this has been in our archive it's not new life. It doesn't agree with all or your opinion. 
Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Did we get that from the group? That's what I'm saying. Yeah, we did that. What we need to do is probably get both of these for you. But somebody needs to pull, somebody needs to take both of these and pull them off the computer and then take the computer out of them and you'll be caught with those. Mm -hmm. It'll be probably okay. easy. Okay. So, uh, we didn't finish our timeline. Let me, how much, what do we got? Am I out of time on the DVDs? No, you're not out of time on the DVDs. I know, we're out of time. Alright, real quick, real quick, we're almost at the end. <laughs> <laughs> Forget the food. The third angel went. I wasn't sure. <laughs> or exactly. When Jeff told me I had four hours, I said, oh, mercy. <laughs> but last May, I said, how, Lord, can I do this in four hours? Uh, well, here we are. We're at the end. It's not the end, but this is where I stopped on the chart. Uh, this is to be continued. Uh, in 1856, we have in this book right here. If I if I can take the time to tell you something, this is the real food. I didn't bring it. Must be back. Anyway, that's where you have to start tomorrow, obviously. Oh, tomorrow, well, I guess. <laughs> okay, but the Hiram Edson Articles appear in 1856 on the Times of the Gentiles. The Hiram Edson Articles on Times of the Gentiles, they first appear in 1856, seven articles that were never completed. And uh, when I stumbled on these articles um, by God's providence, I shouldn't say I stumbled, God had led me to these things. That's Amen. a better way to put it. In my humanity, Stammering lips and stumbling feet is really what how it seemed, but God has led me to these things. And uh you know, when I first heard this message, I thought to myself, you know, this guy's with his wing nut. That's what I thought to myself. <laughs> how can any of this help send the Adventist of the angel world out? But Curiosity got the best of me, and I was challenged by a statement that Jeff made that how many of you here can give a study on the seven trumpets in a group like we are today? Not one hand, but not one. Hand. It was a house full of seven deaths. A house. And I thought that that was pretty important. And I was one of those who couldn't raise their hand. So I was challenged, and so I was taken, I went home and I had, I had one of these charts on my wall, the small one. So I said, I'm gonna, I'll show him. <laughs> I'm gonna learn everything on that chart as well as William Miller and James White. I'm, I'm gonna show him. So I started off on my little escapade, you know, full of pride and all that mess. And I thought to myself, okay. And so the first thing the Lord said to me was, He says, I want you, Dwayne, He says, if you want to understand, the Lord spoke to me, He says, I want you to understand this chart. He says, that's a good thing. He says, you can't give a talk with seven trumpets anyway, if you need to learn it. He says, that's great. He says, but I don't want you to learn that first. He says, I want you to learn first. Go back to ancient Israel's history prior to 457 B.C. That's what I want you to do, to learn the charge. Well, I thought to myself, what good is that going to do? You know, the guy, somebody told me one time that I need to stop being so defiant. <laughs> it's true. Stubborn. Stop being so stubborn. Gotta have my own way. The Lord speaking to me, he says, do this, and I said, what for? But I went ahead in my defiancy and started off on this little book, my little walk through the Bible chronology. And I laid it out of a timeline, I got it here. And I, this is my first timeline. I wrote it all out. Here's 457 BC, and I wrote everything out that I knew going that way, but everything back here I didn't know. So, so the Lord of the Seven Trumpets, God had to take me back into uh, Israelite history so I could learn the Seven Trumpets. Now, what, it, what I first learned was that Isaiah received his gospel call in 739 BC. I, I put it on my timeline. I said, well, okay, so what? And then, in 2 Kings, turn to 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 5. Yeah. 
17, verse 5 of 2 Kings. And I found this. You know, the Lord has blessed Dwayne Dewey in many ways. But one of the things he's given to me is a Bible that I bought at the thrift store for 50 cents. And in that Bible, in the, in the margin, is Usher's Chronology. Usher's Chronology. He was an English divine that lived in the uh, late, uh, early 16th century. 16th century? Something like and uh, all the early Bibles in Miller's day were printed with Usher's chronology, but now they don't do that. But this one was done by the voice of prophecy, and by God's grace, by His wonderful grace, I have Usher's chronology in the margin of my Bible. <coughs> and even when I found this, I didn't know that. I, I failed to read the introduction to my Bible. But once I found it, I went back and read the introduction, and I found out it was Usher's chronology. But I wrote this down on my timeline. It says 723 B.C. It says... The king of Assyria came up through all the land and went up to Samaria and he besieged it three years. The year 723 BC. And I wrote that on my timeline. And I said, okay, what does that mean? I was clueless. I didn't know. But the Lord was leading me step by step to understand truth. Okay. So six months later, in my struggle to try to understand the Millerite chart, in desperation one morning, I went to these books. I have, there's 12 of these. These are the Second Advent Review and Sabbath Herald. These were the ones that they did after the Advent Review. And I just, I, you know, on a bookshelf in a row, and I just, I didn't even realize which one I was picking out, but I just kind of reached the middle of the stack and I pulled the book out. And I said, well, maybe there's something in here I can find that will help me. <coughs> And I opened up the book, and the first article I opened to was by Hiram. It's called The Times of the Gentiles. Amen. Yeah. That's when I called him. When I read those articles, I knew he had light no one had seen. So it's a good thing to be able to give a study on the seven trumpets. And it is a wonderful thing to know these truths at the end of the world. Amen. And God is gracious. So, <laughs> Amen. Loving Father in heaven, Lord, in our uh, humanity, uh, Paul says it best. He says, I die daily. The Lord, we're so stubborn and we're so uh, self-willed. Lord, help us to understand that Jesus is coming. And he wants us to be ready. He wants us to have our characters washed white in the blood of the Lamb. Lord, we would plead with you this morning that you would preserve everyone here and those families here represented. That these advancing lines of truth will take us to the cross in such a way that we will see the sacrifice Jesus has paid for our eternal life. Please, Lord, help us to understand that Jesus has poured out all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. He's given his own life that we might have eternal life. Please help us, Lord, to love him in return. This morning we want to ask you also, Lord, for a blessing on our breakfast. Please help us to appreciate the things you give us day by day. To realize that you care for us as the Father cares for his children and that you love us. Thank you for everything this morning, Lord, that you do. Lord, we need three volunteers this morning to help us in the kitchen. So we ask you for this too. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.